Um, so, Microsoft. Sorry. Uh, I, I will say. Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah. We're talking about Howard's presentation, and and it's hard <laughs> <laughs> to step in after Howard, and I'll do my best. Um, so I know there are at least some folks who are more expert in C plus plus than I am in this room, and so I'm going to rely on help from them, and I have. Rewards if you don't, if you consider Skittles or Starburst rewards. So New York doesn't consider those rewards. Well, Starburst as well. I, so so participation, help, it's all encouraged. Um, so engage. So I've got um, I guess that's six different stuff, different topics to cover. Um, the first four are going to go by pretty fast. There's just not a lot to do, but they're well worth talking about. So in case you aren't aware of them. You know that they're there, that they're really useful. Um, and then the last two, const expert and very other templates, we're going to take a little bit more time. Will you be posting these? Yes, yes they will be posted. And the good news is that at least before I transferred the code from my, uh, my C files onto the slides, it all compiled under uh, GCC 4.7. So uh, the first one to talk about is underscore pragma. How many of you do uh, development with more than one compiler that you have to worry about? OK, so there are a few of you. I'm one of those. So I, I do embedded development, and we do, um, it's not you know, dual compilation, where we run the bulk of the embedded code both under Visual Studio and in the real embedded environment. And to get the embedded code to run fast, I have to use fragments. So I use fragments, and uh, the typical use of a fragment has a pound sign in it. And that means that you can't embed it in a macro, because as soon as it sees the pound sign, then the, the macro blows up. So this was something that the uh, C11 folks borrowed from C99. It's uh, underscore capital P pragma. And um, it it ends up expanding into a pound pragma at just the right instant. <laughs> uh, so you can put this inside of a macro. And um, it really can do wonders for cleaning up your code if you use pragmas. So this is how I use it. This is exactly, well, no. This is, one of, one of these is a fiction. Um, so the, uh, well, no, I have to nah, I, this is small enough. I'm good with my hands. I'm not sure they would work anyway. What's that? Oh, it's called oh, it's 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 okay. No. Um, anyway, this, this top one is one that I use regularly. And we'll see how it gets, we see it in code in just a minute on one more <coughs> side. Um, but basically what you're saying is that if uh, underscore underscore a b s p t s 201 underscore underscore is defined, then we're going to say that Tiger Shark Pragma is a underscore pragma that takes some arguments. And otherwise, it just evaporates. So we're going to say it, you know, nothing there. And then the other compiler that I deal with is Win32. And, and as Win32 supports uh, C11, it will need to support this as well. I can't use this right now, but I would very much like to. And so, for example, I've got a choice. I can either use the macro that I just defined, and fortunately, I guess there were a number of folks making fun of macros earlier. Um, I like macros. I, I know they have their faults, but there's a place in the world for macros. Um, so I find this much easier to read than all the pound defined guys. And similarly, if I were working with the, the user compiler, uh, I would find this a heck of a lot easier to read. Than this. Yes, I, I, I think you can actually have more than one on this copy, but not on one of them. Which would allow you to basically compile the first two. Yeah, so the first two could be uh, a single one. For your consideration. So, yes, are you saying that? Pragma was 
this was standardized? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah. underscore capital P fragment okay. is part of the C11 standard now. Okay. It has been part of the C99 standard and the C11 has adopted it. It is really part of the standard. I didn't, I, I didn't know that until just like three months ago when Alistair happened to mention it in passing. And I said, oh my god! Because I've been using it from C99. That's the reason that I know that it works under the Tiger Shark. Because if the Tiger Shark supports the C99 aspect of underscore capital P pragma. And it works great. So, yes, that's part of C++. Yes, it is. is that the only uh, reserved word with a capital letter in it? Um, that I don't know. Um, I thought there was like a general consensus. Reserved words would never have capital letters. No, yeah, it's always been the case that underscore a couple letters is reserved. But is it a keyword then, or is it something? No, it's a reserved keyword. word. But there haven't, I haven't seen any actual reserved words that use a capital letter. No, actually, they added several in C99. Okay. Yeah. This because is, they didn't want to create any new normally spelled reserved words. Okay. Yeah. So this is it's how I, I believe that what happened was whatever C99 did, that's what was adopted. So it wasn't like the, the C++ language was saying, gee, let's do something with an underscore and a capital letter. They said, well, all right, you know, we want to be as compatible as, as is reasonable with C99. And, and I'm really pleased that they picked this up. This is, this is a nice thing. Um, how many of you haven't used Boost Static Assert? Have not. Okay, so I don't need to, I, there, there are a few of you, um, most of you, most of you had, or do, do you know what a static assert is, everyone? Yes. By the way, I just noticed uh, VC10, Visual Studio 2010, actually supports the pragma thing, but with a double underscore lowercase p. And it doesn't behave right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's there. It was there. I tried it, and it and it didn't do the, the expansion correctly when it was embedded in the macro. So, but thank you. Um, it'll get there. It'll get there. Unfortunately, it's but yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends, I did make another reminder. Do you, do you prefer Starburst or Skittle? Never heard of that. I don't. So. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm uh, trying not to hurt people when I toss these around. Thank you. Well, here. That's right. Oh, wow. Okay, so a static assert is a compile time assert. So anything that the compiler can figure out and evaluate to a bool, it can use to stop compilation. And I do embedded development. This is incredible. A, a standard old assert does me no good. I cannot stop executing. Um, my debug code does not run at speed. I don't care whether my debug code asserts or not. A, a regular old assert does me personally no good at all. For you guys, you're probably not in that situation, although you may be. It doesn't make any difference. You still need to be using static assert every place you can possibly think it's useful. Because it stops during compilation. With a regular assert, you have to actually execute the code. A static assert, you get every single time that it compiles. And it compiles all of your source code. Use static assert. So with that, um, and, and I have uh, authorities to back me up. Yes? Mm -hmm. Is there any difference between both static assert and the new static yeah, assert. So, so it's the implementation. Uh, Boost static assert use template tricks to achieve the same end. And um, the new static assert, it's spelled a little differently. The, you can get better diagnostic messages out of it. Yes. On that note, there's a Boost MPL assert message, which allows you to pass in a C++ identifier, which it will then show during the error. Ah. But at least get some of like that. Yeah, OK. Well, this is this is yet better, I think. You, know, you can you can draw your own thing. Um, so the the new one takes two parameters. There's the the test that has to be resolvable at compile time, and your compiler will tell you if it can't. 
So if it can't figure it out, it will stop and say, hey, I, this is not a static assert I can evaluate. So then you would have to change it. But once it can resolve at a compile time, it will tell you, yeah, if that's, if that's true, then, then we're good. Um, and then you can put in any sort of a string literal that you want, and that's Unicode of any sort. Um, I don't use Unicode, but if you want to put Unicode in there, go right ahead. Um, so I, I still find it used for macros. And what I found as I was working on these slides was that coming up with a new diagnostic message for every single static assert sometimes gets a little tedious. And so if you want to make it easy to use static assert, I suggest you make a macro. Um, and this one uses something else that came in from uh, C99, which is variadic uh, macros. So the, uh, the variadic arguments on the, on the variadic macros, or yeah, um, that expands regardless of whether there are commas or not. It doesn't make any difference. But shouldn't you put the first VAR in parentheses? Because otherwise, oh, I, oh, right, I see. You're letting the compiler yeah. figure it out. Yeah. So the preprocessor things, yeah. the also things, yeah. the compiler will know. Yeah, so the, the slides will be up. If you want to copy that macro and put it in some, some uh, central place, uh, feel free. Um, this, I, I should add, I stole the original version of this from Scott Myers. Um, he didn't do it with variadic macros. And so I, I had some, a couple of times when, when Scott's version of the uh, uh, macro didn't expand quite right. But I haven't had that problem with the variadic arguments. Yes? So I'm not quite, can you explain that VAR is just a tiny bit more? I'm not quite understanding how it works. Oh, okay. Um, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> no chocolate in there? No chocolate. Mm -hmm. There's no chocolate. Um, so my understanding of the way variadic arguments come up in, uh, uh, for, for macros is they take everything inside, well, let's see, so you can have some number of arguments in front of the variadic, and then, and then the tail end of it is variadic. And so with the macro stuff, they're not, they're not as bright about it as they are with variadic templates. They pick up that text, and they say, whatever that text is, whatever's left over, that's my argument. So whether it's got commas or anything else, they don't care, they just go to the end, and they, and they pick everything up, and they call that the piece. So yes. it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Okay. It actually takes commas, and I, I'm not sure if it takes commas, but the point is that if there are no additional arguments, mm -hmm. and you basically invoke another macro and say arc1, arc2, comma, VA arcs, mm -hmm. and there are no arguments, it will actually remove that last comma you wrote. So, it's, so it's, it's, it's slightly more complicated than what I just described. So it's, it's a way to, to manage um, passing commas on. Yeah. yeah. It's like perfect forwarding for macros. Yeah, this is, yeah. It's, the, the, yeah. The reason being, if you've got a template in there, you've got angle bracket x comma y angle bracket, yeah. the preprocessor doesn't know yeah. Yeah. that they belong together and will see it as two separate arguments. Yeah. So the preprocessor might think, your one Boolean expression is made up of three different preprocessor arguments. Right. Right. That's, yeah. So I wasn't intending to really get into periodic arguments, but it, it's good to know they're there. Um, use them if, if you don't mind using macros. So I don't mind using macros. It works for me. Um, so, yeah, and again, this, uh, this particular pound of volume just makes it, uh, lowers the, uh, the resistance to putting in a static assert even even more. Um, so explicit conversion operators. Uh, this was, I believe, sort of an oversight with C99 or C++ uh, and O3. Well, with O3 it was too big of a thing to toss in at the end. Um, so. A conversion operator is a lot
lot like a constructor. It's kind of a, a constructor standing on its head. And you can make explicit cons uh, constructors, but you couldn't make explicit conversion operators. So now we fix that, you can make explicit conversion operators. Now, it's not necessarily, just, just because you can make them explicit, that makes them a little bit better. It doesn't necessarily mean that you want to do it. But if you are going to do, if you're going to make conversion operators, you can consider making them explicit. Um, so here's a case where I've got my class. I can construct it with an int. Um, so I'm making that explicit. And I can uh, return a string from my class. And this is this bottom line is the new part. Yes. Uh, the coolest use of that, in my opinion, is explicit operator bool. And that's the next slide. Okay. Yes. And that's that's exactly the reason to remember all of this stuff. And explicit, well, we'll get there. Let's let's go through the uh, through the, uh, the less interesting aspect of it first. Uh, so anyway, the, the uh, explicit operator uh, where we're converting the string, that's the new part. The other one is, is classic C++. Uh, so once you've made an explicit conversion operator or a, an explicit uh, constructor, you have to do a static cast in order to get to it. That's the sort of the magic incantation. Yes, I really mean to do this. So this is, this is you telling the compiler, I'm not doing this by accident. This is how, you know, really, let me do this, please. So you know, if you don't do the static cast, it won't compile. If you do, do the static cast, it compiles. It's very regular. Uh, but as you pointed out, do you want servers or skills? <laughs> um, servers. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm not going to throw them because they don't. Uh, Did you get it? Yeah. If you want to try it, I think it's that's yeah, yeah, so just Starburst. Oh, did you say? Whatever. <laughs> 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 See, um, watch out. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think he owes you a good question now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, they, uh, they did some extra special stuff with Bool, and this, I think, is particularly cool. Because the uh, explicit Bool conversion is used, what's the line? Um, it is, uh, the explicitness of the Bool conversion is ignored when things are contextually converted to Bool. So, the contextually converted is a situation like if, um, or the case of, uh, the ternary operator. <clears throat> so you now have explicit control when someone says, if some object, you now, if, you, if you're wondering what's going to happen when somebody does that, you as the class writer now get complete control over what's going to happen when somebody says, if your object. So. Um, um, what happens? Yes. Last slide. Uh -huh. On the last line, if you know, say, mc equals true, then will that compile or will that fail? Um, so, mc, well, we haven't, we haven't looked at an assignment operator on my class. No, I mean equals. Well, that's an, you say equals. mc equals true, right? Yeah. So that's an assignment of oh, no. true equals equals. 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 Oh, right. oh, double equals. Okay. Um, it fails. It fails. It fails. Yeah. <coughs> the conversion is not a, not a contextual conversion. Yeah. Right. So if the ternary operator for while and yeah. and for. But you, yes. Can you, uh, in that last line, if you double bang MC, does that convert to bool? <laughs> I think yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. But I guess my point is, you as the class designer, you're now in control of something that you used to not have in bool. Mm -hmm. So, so do this. <laughs> <laughs> 
So did I understand you right that you have two instances, MC1 and MC2, and you said if MC1 double and MC2 it would still work? Yes. Okay. I'm glad you understood that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll start out with MC. If you had no other equality operator um, for my class with MC1 equals equals MC2 compile, or would that fail? Not without an equality operator. So, um, the explicit bool conversion, <coughs> I like that. Um, my inclination for a non bool the, the historic, and we, we don't yet know what best practices are on a lot of this stuff. All we're developing is practices. Uh, so, so my practice for non dealing is going to be conservative, and I'm going to be inclined to still have named functions that do conversions rather than conversion operators, which has been the sort of the long-term stuff. I'm, I'm making an exception for bool because I think that's very powerful. But if I've got stuff going on where there are generics or templates or whatever, then if I need to do that, you know, the explicit stuff, then I, I can have a reliable, well-known name for how do I perform this explicit conversion. And that reliable, well-known name is uh, uh, static. So, we're, we're buzzing through these. Uh, the next topic is decal type. Um, so, decal type is like size of, or what's the one that I hadn't ever heard of, which we're pulling up for. Uh, um, no accept? No accept, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I just learned about no accept from, from Howard. Uh, but it, <coughs> it looks at the expression and doesn't actually you know, execute the expression. It just looks at what would this thing do? What, and so decal type is, what is that type? Um, and it's the, the classic case of, of the need for decal type. Yes? Why would you prefer auto multiplied of uh, arrow decal type to just saying decal type open a time b close mult? Yeah, because A and B aren't in the scope yet. Ah. <laughs> and that's so, so I, I had assumed someone else was going to go into the arrow business. Um, I haven't seen that in any presentations yet. Um, I, I guess it. It, was, it was touched on briefly. You did it? Okay. I'm sorry, I was in a different session. No problem. So good. good. I, anyway, Leor did the, uh, did the arrow uh, for the trailing return. Uh, so, the, the trailing return is to get, if you, if you do this in front of, of molt, it doesn't know that A and B are, are in scope yet. So you do the trailing return to get that. Um, the trailing return in some cases is also easier to read, which would be another reason to do it. Um, but you have to in this case, because you have to have A and B in scope. <laughs> Strikes me that in this particular case, you could say, TA uh, friend friend times TV friend friend. No, no we can mm -hmm. no, because that would fail to compile if T isn't T, oh. TA and TV aren't default constructible. So there's actually the trick with the new function template in the standard called decal valve that you can use for those purposes. But this is just so much easier to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the reason that's, that's relevant is in the case of multiplication, you don't necessarily know what the type is going to be. Let's just imagine that we're doing matrix multiplication, in which case the type that comes back will not be either the type of A or B. It will be something entirely different, or could be something entirely different. So, yes? <laughs> oh, um, so, so here, this is, this is typically how it would be used. Um, this is a way of, of testing for this stuff. One of the things I found as I was developing the code is, um, well, I, I guess we'll get to that in the second slide. So you got something to say? Yeah, I have a question that I just have to ask while Howard is still in the room. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Um, does anyone, do you know why it's called this 
horrible name instead of typo? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, so so it, it is, and well, I, I, you you were in on the. Actually, I, w I wasn't part of the committee on this one. Uh, it was in another working group. So, but uh, do you want me to answer that question? I think I think your answer is likely more accurate. Than <laughs> the 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 reason is because GCC already had a type of that even without the underscores, and it doesn't mean the same thing as this. Um, and that's a reason. <laughs> and, and there were GCC representatives in the room to argue their position that they didn't want to change their type of and break customer code, so uh, so they came up with this new horrible name. Same thing happened with unord unordered containers. Yeah. Same thing happened with forward list. Um, it happens. Yeah. On, on the yes. subject, I was wondering, why doesn't the standard library use this exact thing for cumulate, for, for the algorithm cumulate? Mm. I don't know who did accumulate because I think accumulate right now returns t, and but yet if say accumulate is really multiplied, you don't want to return t, you want to return t operation t. Because um, it was written for ninety eight. Okay. First, because it was written for ninety eight, and second, because I don't think it's implementable if it doesn't return t. Because you wouldn't know what t is going to Because if t if t could change at, after one multiplication. Then in the next iteration of the accumulation loop, you suddenly have a different type, and it just doesn't work. T is also inferred by one of the template argument or function argument. Right. It can be whatever, whatever you want. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to a case later on where there's something kind of like what this one. Yes, sir. I've got a question for Howard. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so this this naming thing strikes me as wacky because. All the stuff is in namespace std, if I'm not mistaken, which you can't keyword. put in the keyword. keyword. This one is, but unordered collection and forward list. GCC. That, that was my argument, and it was a huge argument on the committee, and I lost. <laughs> okay. But so they, GCC had already put that stuff in std? Yes, that all. is correct. It was actually taken where on the uh, on unordered list, I mean, on uh, uh, the unordered containers. All of GCC had two, but yeah. Yeah. It's the way it is. So, isn't there some you know thing on page fourteen hundred of the standard? <laughs> you got to put anything in the space has to be it's an extension. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. This is getting in deep, but. Suppose instead of a times b, you were doing a ternary operator, and so you're saying a greater than b colon a or question mark a yes, colon so b. That can be so you got two types going there, and you don't know which one. Which you do. That's well defined. Yeah. It, oh, same as the regular. Yeah. It has to be something that's known in compile time. So you can do that with four greater than seven, but. You know, it would have to be a literal. So this is something that compiler results. The ternary operator actually has a well-defined type which results with that, I believe. It's not oh, okay. Yeah, every expression is a pleasantly well-defined type. That's how the language works. Okay. The ternary operator, you can't have, if it can't resolve the type, it's not needed. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So you have to resolve it. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm a, I'm a, a macro fan. And as I was, so to back up, I just started learning a bunch of this stuff a few months back. And as I was thrashing around, um, I did very added templates first. And, and uh, as I was saying, hey, this looks like a great place to talk, toss in a decal type. And I toss it in there and figure it would just work. And it almost never compiled right. So I'm going to go through the, the rules for, for decal type. But sometimes what you think is the decal, or ought to be the decal type, isn't. And this gave me a way of finding out whether it was doing what I thought it was supposed to be doing or not. So anyway, I, I like this particular macro. You may, it certainly you won't use this as much as a static assert. This is more for debugging. And maybe you guys are more, enough more clever than I am that you won't need it. Or you will have learned how decal type works, where I was just thrashing around. 
Um, so there are, I think the uh, standard says there are five rules. I condensed them a little bit. Um, but the, typically the way you'll use decal type is that you want to know what is returned from a function. And in the case where you, you pass decal type a function, what you get back is the declared return type from that function. So it's um, decal type is, is ugly to say, but to a certain extent, it makes sense if you think of it as declared type. So this is the declared type of the function is what you get. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you're returning that, uh, basically anything that you return, that's what you get. Um, so if it returns to uh, most kinds of variables, um, one local scope, namespace scope, a static member variable, or a function parameter, um, then the type that you have, that you're looking at, that's what you get back. So again, this one's really straightforward. Um, so I'm using that macro. This stuff all just, you know. Um, gets a little bit more interesting as you start digging through, like here I've got a struct and you can look at the number of the structs and the number of the struct is charmed. Um, you can do the direction, it'll chase all that down. That's all stuff the compiler already knows how to do. So, yeah, so I do have five rules. I just packed two of them onto, onto one slide. Um, so these are cases, I, I think that the, uh, Appropriately, the, the standards folks wanted to cover every single case they could think of. What happens if somebody tosses in three plus two? So they wanted to say, if you do that, here's what we do. Uh, so <coughs> if uh, if e is an L value, then what you get back is a reference, a an L value reference to uh, to whatever type that is, and then if uh, and again, that's only if rules one and two don't apply. And again, if rules one and two don't apply, and he is an R value, then what you get back is the thing that the R value refers to. So in this case, it's like, what is the decal type of one plus two? You get an int. And lastly, um, I have, do, you, do you know who pushed for this? I can't remember. I, I think this. Ago. I think was, was Yeah, I think this was really interesting. Um, so, I hope you never have to use this. I think this was for folks who were you know, working on, you know, Uber templates, and you know, some of you will be doing that, no doubt. I'm not one of those folks. Uh, so, if you put some extra parentheses around the thing that you're referring to, uh, what you get back is a reference to the type of. Uh, and the most interesting aspect of this is, um, so here we've got a struct, S of T. None of these guys are, are cons. But if I have a uh, const uh, pointer to that, you so tell me I'm, I'm wrong. I'm not entirely sure, and Howard would correct me, I hope, but if I'm wrong, but I think that this rule doesn't exist. Um, so what actually happens? So what actually happens is if you just do decal type of i, mm -hmm. then the first rule uh, or the second rule kicks in and it says, okay, i is declared as an int. Okay. If you wrap extra parentheses around that, yeah. like you have here, yeah. then you don't have decal type of a variable. You have decal type of a parenthes a parenthesis expression that contains a reference to i. And that expression is a is an L value, and therefore it's you get three. You, it's rule three. Okay. And you get interest as the result. Okay. Even if he's wrong, I think he deserves the skills. <laughs> I asked him. He doesn't want any. He's he's definitely learning. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's, he's learning. Okay. So anyway. I, I think of it as, as rule five. I put extra parentheses around there. And I think when I was looking at a, 
a non-published version of the standard. They actually included this as one of the things they talked about. So the big difference is what happens when the thing you put parentheses around is not an alpha. Mm -hmm. Because if you write decal type, parent open, parent open, five parent close, parent close, you won't get interact. You will get int. Okay. And that's 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 an important thing because this is misleading this way. Oh, all right. Well, yes. Since decal type is a declaration, what what would prevent you from just saying decal type? And then putting a print uh, ampersand at the after the last print, like before the comma, like wouldn't that be way more clear in every single case? This is relying on like an incredibly obscure rule, like an incredibly obscure interpretation of a rule. Just from a, a standpoint, if you want to reference, put an ampersand after the decal line. Oh. Um. That is, you're suggesting decal type shouldn't put in a reference. Well, I mean, just in this case, even, I mean, it's not obviously the language is how the language is, but if you're using the language, uh, then it would make sense to never, ever rely on this rule. OK. So is the well, point. Sebastian is suggesting that this rule doesn't exist. Were you suggesting this rule doesn't exist? Or it doesn't exist. exist. OK. Or to rely on rule 3 to interpret it as that. Okay. I'm, you guys are in way deeper than I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is maybe a silly question, but can you nest decal types? Like if I put decal type, decal type, decal type, decal type, will that compile in one? I assume so, but I haven't tried it. Well, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. No, yeah it's it's not. Decal type is a type, and the, okay. the argument must be an expression. Yeah. All right. You could stick it into a decal though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if you use decal type, and because you were squeezed into it because of you know, whatever reason, and there are a number of reasons, um, sometimes it doesn't give you exactly what you want. So there are some elements of the standard library that you can use to uh, either suck things off of what came back from decal type or to add decorations. So be aware of these are here. You don't necessarily need to remember all the names, but if you get into that position, then you know Hey, gee, there's something in the standard library that can help me out. Um, so, yeah, I, this, it, when, for me, the rule I'm going to remember is that it almost always returns or gives me, hands me the declared type. And sometimes it doesn't, but when, when it gets funny, I'll go look up the rules. For me, I remember those guys in the, uh, in the standard library. Yeah. Could you admit the decal type? Can you? Can you? If I'm admitting the column error, so like if I'm debugging some huge yeah. complex template thing, and I like, you know, what is that expression for real? It would be nice to say column error, you know, expression. And, and I, the so, type. yeah, so there's, I, I have seen uses of type up. I do not know if they are part of the standard. I believe that. Some compilers will give you ways of getting a textual version of a type, but I don't know that that's part of the standard. Yeah, uh, NPL print is your friend if you want to do that. If you have a big complicated type and you want to know what it evaluates to a big complicated type computation, you just pass it to NPL print and turn on the warning generation and you'll see a warning telling you exactly what that type is. And that's a boost thing? Yep, boost NPL print. Okay. Go ahead. So, okay. There's actually four rules, and they um, basically what it says is if it's an unparenthesized um, exp expression, then it's the type. It's, if it's an unparenthesized thing, yeah. then it's the type of that thing. Uh, but but if it's an um, if it's an L value, then it's the type reference. So I think that's where the parentheses cause it. Oh, yeah, okay. so it's because it's becoming um, an L value. It's becoming an L value, but it doesn't hit the first one. Okay. Which, which would, if it were, weren't parenthesized, it, it would determine that it's, it's, it's a longer, I'm saying thing because it's a paragraph. And I'm a, yeah. 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 Okay, so.
So anyway, I, for me personally, uh, I think you're better off using auto whenever you can. Um, so, but sometimes you can, and then you know, this can help. Them. So, 45 minutes into it, I'm running slow. I didn't expect to be doing that. So, um, Consta Expert is uh, something that allows you to compute stuff at compile time. And I am, I am, once I started digging into this, I got ever so excited about this. Um, so, I mean, back when they did C++ 98, was being able to put the static constant in the, in the body of a class, and, and knowing that that was going to propagate into the, the compiled code, you know, that was, I, I used that any number of times, and now I'm no longer restricted. So, yeah, prefer uh, compiled time computations over runtime computations. Yeah, you have to find somebody famous to say. Oh. <laughs> we're up there, we're out here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, they're generalized constant, constant expressions. Where we used to be able to do this with a uh, static constant, you can now do this with um, floats, and with, uh, functions, and with constructors. You know, and not just floats, but basically any user-defined types, literals, and just all sorts of amazing things. So let's start small. Um, we've got E here. And it's and just for grins, I put in a template. That doesn't have to be a template, but I, I get in these templates sometimes. Um, and so the default is that when you ask for E, you get it in a double. Um, but you can ask for E as a float or E as an ends, and then I can do static asserts, and I can compare these values. And the results come back at compile time. So your compiler is going to be looking at those float values and doing static asserts with them. They will be embedded into your code. So you can have constexts for variables. You could have constex for functions. Um, if you make a constex for variable, it has to be immediately constructed or assigned value. It can only be assigned literal values, constex for values, which are things you may have figured out previously, or the return value from a constex for function. We'll get to those in just a minute. But basically what we're talking about is things that the compiler knows about. So what you're doing is you're building stuff that the compiler knows about. If you have to, if, if runtime were involved, then you're out of luck. The compiler will tell you if it can't figure it out. So this is all good compile time stuff. Yeah. I don't know. With the new, um, I can't remember, the in initialization uh, mm -hmm. syntax, if you load a bunch of values into a vector, you can't do like, Vectors of zero and get back that you put a one in because it's, because that's a runtime because that's a runtime yeah. and vector is not a literal type. So yeah, even though it knows that there's going to be it a constant. Yeah, okay. <coughs> but but we're going to get there's something sort of like that that you actually can do. Okay. Um, and I think I think const expert is one of those features that um, has has a likelihood to someone's going to figure out something just amazing. This does. Um, I'm, we don't. We don't know all of its tricks yet. Um, so, if you've got a user-defined type that you're calling a const expert, then it has to have a constructor that's const expert. So that's a kind of a function, if you will. So if you have a const expert constructor, you can have a const expert uh, user-defined type. So for a const expert function, it can't be virtual. It has to return a literal or const expert type. Um, all of its parameters must be literal or const expert types. And the body is very constrained. Um, it can contain, and there, there's this laundry list of all the things that it can contain. 
but in effect, that laundry list summarizes to stuff that's safe. Things like static assert type defs, uh, the new uh, using, which is the, the alias or you know, the, the newer version of type def. In terms of executable, or well, in terms of, I don't want to call it executable code. Um, in terms of, of code that you would think of as executable, um, you can have one statement and it has to return a value. So that, that statement can contain only literals, const expert variables, and const expert functions. I didn't have enough room on the slide to say const expert functions. Um, but particularly interestingly, the compiler is told as it, because the compiler has to evaluate all this stuff. Remember, this is happening at compile time. So if the compiler runs into a case, you know, let's say that we've got um, ternary operators or whatever, and there's a part of that ternary, ternary operator that the compiler is able to figure out, hey, I don't need to evaluate that. Then it hops over it and doesn't actually look at it. And this becomes really important a little bit later on, we'll see. So yeah, uh, unevaluated, and so that's that's a function of stuff that got passed in. If there's an unevaluated and or 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 sub expression, those just the, the compiler is supposed to. You know, I'm not looking. I'm not seeing that. So let's make some. Yes. I thought that the rule was that, that if a function was const expression, that just all of the returning statements would have to be returns and it was const expression. And that if there was an if branch, for example, it would just have to be working on um, a const expression. I mean, at least, at least I know that's how GCC works. If you, if you, if you, if you, okay. Um, I, I just try it right, right here. I've got a function that's got a takes a template parameter that's um, a, a an int, and it has an if statement and if b, wow. then return one, else return two. Yeah, I was unable to get that to compile uh, on for for me using 4.7.0. And at least when I look at the standard, my impression is that you just get to write the one you want. It's quite explicit. Exactly one return statement. <laughs> okay, so I just, so yeah. you have other statements, it just can't be return statements. Well, you, yeah. You step calculation. Right, but if return, else return, doesn't matter. Yeah, so when, I, when I thrashed about with it, um, and, and all of the various examples I, I found digging around, um, the, uh, I was, I was, I was stuck doing it with one line, but I could, I could have misunderstood. No, but no, it, it, well, the claim doesn't like it, so it might just be GCC. Yeah. So. All statements, static asserts, type defs, declarations, directives, and exactly one return statement. Since you can do no this else with two returns, you can do with the ternary operator. And yeah. Turn right. that one return statement. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and we'll see. We'll, we'll see some uses of the ternary operator in just a couple slides. And you can find and use the, the processor to find this too. So, so let's make something. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a constant string. And uh, we're going to construct it with a, uh, an array of char. And we know what the, uh, what the size of the array is. Um, we're going to have an array operator, and that digs into the array of char and pulls out a char. And we're going to be able to return the size. Because we know what the size is, because we know what the size of the array is. So this is all happening at compile time. Oh, yeah. Um, so I didn't point out this blue circle. Um, so there's a throw in there. And throws aren't usually compiled on things. <coughs> so usually statements, right? Throws are expression. Yeah. So so it's hard to throw a compiled time. So what's it doing? You guys are all asleep. <laughs> I can't blame you, it's late in the afternoon. If it's if it doesn't work out to be a, in that range, if it's in that range. The first part will, the first, uh, the then clause will be used and the else clause is ignored. Mm -hmm. And if it's not in range, then you're not a constant expression and either 
you're not being evaluated in a constant expression context and you'll get a runtime throw where you're being evaluated in a constant expression context and you and the compiler will say, hey, this isn't constant expression. Yeah. You lose. Yeah, that's exactly right. So and and do you prefer starbursts or starbursts? Starburst. <laughs> So, so we're only going to evaluate that throw in the case of somebody trying to, to index out of the range of the string that I've been passed. And in that case, the compiler will say, hey, I'm going to evaluate, hey, I've got a throw. I can't do that at compile time. Your compiler will fail. So the thing about const, let's see if I can get the name right. Um, the thing about const expert is that it doesn't have to just be used, or a, a const expert function doesn't have to just be used at compile time. You can also use it at runtime. And why that choice was made, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I can see the value for debug. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't want to get into that. Nevertheless, you, if you have a const expert expression or function, that doesn't mean it can only be used at compile time. It can also be used at runtime. Right. Yes. I would guess that in uh, you know in a template context, there's situations where you would know. Yeah. yeah. It's not just templates. You you compute some index through some complex you know not compile time method and call this function. Yeah. It's not a context. It's not a context for that if you're not using it in a context or context, it's just an expression. Right. Yeah. So it, it does, it, it makes the function usable in more contexts. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, but anyway, that's the case. That if just because it's declared context or doesn't mean you have to use it at compile time. If the compiler looks at it and says, you know, I've got i in my hands and I don't know what the value of i is, then it's not going to do this stuff at compile time. It's going to, at runtime, it's going to call that Put, put the code in the, uh, in the object and it, it's going to call that at runtime. So in that case, when we're actually running, you'll get the throw. Otherwise, it will fail to compile and you'll go look at your code and it'll say, oh, on this line it says, oh, I can't do that. <coughs> so we just talked through the, uh, the throw in the const expert function. Thank you for, for the uh, lucid description. So const expert functions called with non-literals turn into just plain old functions or plain old constructors. So now that we have this thing, what can we do with it? Well, all right, I can find out. So if I make one of these uh, string cons, I can find out how big the string is. I can go suck a value out of it. Is that very exciting? And the answer for me, at least, is no. We didn't do anything very interesting. So, well, let's try again. Let's try making something that's maybe a little bit more interesting. So we're going to leverage this thing that wasn't very interesting a minute ago. So I'm going to make something that I'll call a binary const. And I'm going to pass it um, one of these strings. And I'm going to make it locally. So in fact, we're just going to call a binary const with a quoted string. Um, So there's our string, um, there's an n, we're going to count something, and then there's an x, we're going to evaluate something. So as we come in here, we're going to say, well, n0, let's check the size. Let's, uh, oh, here, we've got something that looks like recursion going on here. So if, if we see a comma or a space, then, well, we're just going to call ourselves again, and we're going to increment a number, and we're going to pass x down, x came in as 0, x is just going to stay put. If we see a 0, yeah, all right, well, let's take x, we're going to multiply it by 2. And if we see a 1, we're going to take x, we're going to multiply it by 2, and we're going to add 1. And then we're going to walk through these things. And if we get in something other than a comma, a space, a 0, or a 1, we're going to do a throw. So what have we got here? Complex time switch. Beg your pardon? Uh, complex time switch. It's a compile time switch. Um, 
Yeah, it was well, sort of, sort of. It was yeah. binary literal. Not combining that with user defined literals. <laughs> yeah, I looked a little bit at user defined literals, and and in a funny way, this is a little bit more flexible because the user defined literals are are highly constrained on what what you can put in. And with this, because I'm surrounding it with quotes, I get a lot more leeway about what I want to do. Now, I'm an embedded guy, and I'm always thrashing around with registers. And so once I, and I've done this a, a number of years back, something kind of like this with templates. And it was awkward and ugly. We just did this in about nine lines of code. And we've now introduced a way of discrete. You know, I can now put binary labels <coughs> in place at compile time. There is no runtime cost to this. So I'm making all these guys at compile time. I can see exactly where all the bits are. If I toss in a value that it doesn't like, it's not going to compile. I can do uh, operations on these things at compile time. So the static assert, did I get all of my bits? I can sum all these guys and be sure that I accounted for all my bits. Yes. So what you've really done is built a little mini parser at compile time. Yes. 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 Powerful. Yeah. I was just stunned. That's like, that's nice. Was, was this use contemplated? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I saw it again. This eliminates a bunch of. Um, Meta programming. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. this. Yeah. To me, this is just mind blowing. Yes. So one of the ideas that um, me and some of the Spirit developers have been throwing around is the idea of having a compile time Spirit, where you can give it input at compile time, and your parser will run at compile time, and you could define a grammar, a Spirit grammar, um, which th those are um, parsed. Those grammars are created at compile time currently, but we think it'd be pretty cool if we could. You know, if you have some static um, stuff you want to parse, it, why, why have that parsed at runtime? Why not just parse that at yeah. compile time? Just get it done with, right? Mm -hmm. Anything you can do at compile time should be done at compile time. So this is amazing. I, 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 I have not seen another example. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take credit for this. This, this was stuff that. that that I looked at other examples and it was it was like this this light went off. It's like, oh my God, nine lines and I can I can build binary literals. I, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say I keep seeing that throw at the bottom uh -huh. and it bothers me because that's a runtime thing and I wonder if there's a Better, you know, static sort of false, and then put out your message. I try to be more of a yeah. So the problem is that static assert doesn't have a context, um, and you know, what what I really wanted to do. So so to me at least, and this is this is, I have I have a minor beef with const expert that there are absolutely functions that it makes sense to compile them to to do them at compile time. Um, and and if you can't do them at compile time, do them at runtime. There are other functions because, particularly because of the constraints on how you would write this code. There is code that you would put into a const expert function that has no business running at runtime. Uh, one of the things that I was as I was messing around with this, um, I had another example where I was computing a square root, and you can do it. You can compute a square root with a const expert, even with you know, floats and doubles. Okay. The problem is the code is miserable, and it's going to be just a, just appallingly slow if you were to actually do it at runtime. It has no business running at runtime, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But and there's as far as I know, I'm I'm hoping some genius will come up with a way to poison a const expert function so that it will only run at compile time. I thrashed around for a while. I couldn't find it. So, and so you're, you're saying that, 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 that maybe someone would come up with something. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm hoping. 
they get really designed for that's it. That's a big constraint from a compile time programmer's perspective. A big constraint on context for Python is that they have to be able to run at runtime. That's why you can't put a static assert there mm -hmm. on the parameter value. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I, I wish for a way to poison a function so that if I tried to, if, if I was telling the compiler that I'm going to run this const expert function at, at runtime, it would say, oh no, you're not. <laughs> oh. but, but as far as I know, there is no way to poison the function. To poison it at compile time? To, yes, so, so wow. at compile, because the, the compiler knows whether it's, gonna, whether it's invoking this thing now at compile right. time or whether it's going to invoke it later on at runtime. And I would like to be able to tell the compiler through some bizarre trick. Please not. Yes? I, this is, I'm shooting from the hip. What if instead of throw, you had it call some function that was declared but not defined, you might at least get a link time error? Yeah. Thank you. OK, yeah, that's, that's well worth trying. And uh, yeah, I think that would, yes, that's probably it. OK, so there is a lot of private private function to some class to get a compile time. Yeah, but yeah. the problem is that it, I think that would actually give you the compile time error always. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Howard's suggestion, I mean, it depends yeah. on the compiler what it exactly does. I think it will be fragile because there's always a chance you get the, the link time error even if you didn't call it at runtime. Because right. the compiler yeah. decided, oh, I I think it's bad I emit the reference with, I emit the code to the const expert function anyway, and then you have the reference in there. Yeah. Right. Might work. Yeah, so it would be, like, uh, it, it wouldn't be necessarily guaranteed that yeah. uh, by the standard. Right. It might work with some compilers and not others. Anyway, so that's what I wish for. I don't have that. Nevertheless, this is amazing. And so, so, uh, I'm an embedded guy. I don't mind looking at this assembly. So I dug into the file. What was actually left? This was what was left. The strings were gone. It did not leave the strings in the object file. That's all that was left. That's awesome. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> so, and I was having such a great time, I had to make some more. <laughs> And they're no different from any other rest. I think you've answered your question of who's gonna what, who's gonna come up with some really brilliant thing to do with the const expert. <laughs> well, I don't know that this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <It's all> the <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I like it. Um, yes. Well, is there a way to control the recursion depth on that? Because mm -hmm. if you put on too many or too many, mm -hmm. yes. So, um, and, and I, for the, for the binary literal, um, <coughs> what there, in, in another version of it that's more complicated to look at, so I didn't put it in the slides, I added one more value that got passed along that would count the number of bits that it accumulated. You can, given t, you can, there are uh, traits for t that will tell you how many bits are in t. You have to be a little careful with it because the, uh, the signed and unsigned and floats and so forth, you have to handle them all a little differently. But you can go ask that type, how many bits do you have? And then you can count those bits. And then as you're, as you're buzzing along through here, if someone has passed you more zeros and ones than you have bits, then you can walk into that throw or the reference to the, uh, um, to the unavailable function. So yeah, there's definitely a way to do that. And it's, it's one more variable. It does make the code a little bit harder to, to look at and understand, so I didn't include that. And I'm sure you get some interesting error messages if you're way down and maybe running. Right it's not, at least with, with GCC, the error messages were not too bad. Um, it, the, the fact that it was deep into the recursion didn't seem to bug it very much, uh, unlike templates. Um, yeah, it was, it was really nice. So uh, I did some other thrashing around. Um, uh, it, go ahead. Sorry, just one going back to the throw or the poisoning thing. Yeah. Is there a way to send it on an infinite recursion that would blow up? 
pile on her. Oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was her answer. There's your answer. You'll yeah, probably this will take a while. We'll stop when <laughs> everything freezes. Yeah. So, um, yes, you can you can blow up your compiler. Actually, I think the compiler is clever enough that there's a there's an upper or a, a a minimum required recursion depth for constacts for of a hundred. I think that's in the standard. So you have to be able to recurse at least a hundred. Your compiler will be smart enough not to, to really blow itself out of the water because it knows what it's doing. And it'll say at some point, this is not realistic, I'm gonna stop now. So, yeah, you can you can recurse too far in, and that's implementation defined, but there is a a pretty reasonable limit that's guaranteed by the standard. So one of the things I when I was working on the uh, the square root, I tried digging into the internals of the floating point. You can't get that. I believe that's because uh, when if you if you think about cross compilation, um, the floating point representation on the platform that you're in right now may not be the same as the floating point representation representation for the target. So you can't actually know what's inside the floating point when you're here in this compiler. So. It goes to, to I, I, I did all sorts of stuff trying to dig into it. And at one point, I think GCC just kind of sat there and looked at me and said, no, we're not going to show that to <laughs> you. So it was, it was interesting. So you can't dig into the internals of a floating point. Um, and similarly, because your target may not be the same as you know, the machine you're running on, your floating point values. I, there's a great, uh, one of the few places where I could really read the standard. They had a great example of, of using floating point const expert values. And you know, here's one at runtime, here's one that we computed at compile time. And they may not come out to be close enough that you actually feel like you got the same answer. So you know, be aware when you're doing floating point stuff with this, you're, you're doing that at your own risk. But you can do it. Yes. Well, I mean, that's that would be true with normal code too, right? Yeah. I mean, if I if I have a floating point expression that's getting compiled by the compiler too. Yeah. FP FP. Yeah. Floating point is brought. Yeah. So, you know, just just to be aware, um, integer calculations you got no problems, but floating point is, as Alan says, floating. Point. Um, so, as a quality of implementation issue, the compiler may evaluate this stuff at runtime. Um, so, when I was messing with GCC, GCC always, it, it was good. It was like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're right here. And I believe that if the compiler sees, you know, says we're going to do a const expert, and then later on, we're doing something with that value that is going to be required at compile time. Like, we're doing a static assert, or if we're determining the size of an array, then the compiler has no choice. It's got to do it. But if you give it a little leeway, then the standard says, well, you know, you don't have to do it at compile time, if nobody can tell. Um, so, and that's, that's a quality of implementation issue. So get to know your compiler if you're going to do this stuff. Yeah. So actually, I think about thinking about that, I mean, you're, you would know about this. If I'm compiling for a target that is different entirely from the machine I'm compiling on, yeah. isn't, doesn't, isn't it incumbent on the compiler to make sure that its compile time calculations in fact match the, or can or can it? Depends. I mean, it, 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 yeah. Um, it, I, yeah. I, I think that the, the yeah. fact of the matter is that when you're, when you're dealing with floating point, you just there are a bunch of things that are very, very hard to control. Same answer. <laughs> so, I like these. So the key is you have to declare your variables constructs for. Making the functions doesn't do you any good. You have to.
to declare the variables constant for it. So when I actually get to use C++11, which may be years from now, <laughs> since you know, I'm using an embedded compiler, who knows when they're going to jump. They, I asked them, they said, oh, we don't have any plans. <laughs> so when I eventually get to use it, you're going to see constructs for everywhere. We don't get the rolling on the compiler? No, we have to pay for that. Um, so you have to declare the variables constructs for or they won't get evaluated. Uh, yes. I guess the question becomes, is there an LLVM back end for your target? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to convince the, uh, the, the management to, to go for that. So compile time algorithms sometimes make really poor runtime algorithms, especially given the constraints of the const expert function. So if you make a const expert function, because as far as we know, there is no way to poison it so that you can't run it at runtime. You have to use it with caution. Because if you end up running that code at runtime, <coughs> you've got potentially a, a mass, well, particularly in the case of the square root function uh, that I wrote, you have this, this terrifying runtime cost that you just didn't need to pay for. Yeah. But you also said if you static assert it, it's got to go to compile time. So yeah. you're either going to fail the static assert or... Yeah, but you can't put the static assert as, as an element of the ternary function. So, because it doesn't, it doesn't live in that context. No, you have to put it somewhere else just to make sure... You yeah, and I, anyway, I, I tried that. And, and the static assert didn't do the magic for me. Now, maybe you're the one who can come up with the great way to poison the function. And maybe it happens with no, the I meant outside of the function or something. If you actually just well, that, that would make sure that it gets evaluated at, at, at compile time, and that's great. But you know, if let's just say that you're not watching very closely and you just invoke this function, it happens to be sitting around and it's a member of your of your class, and it is a const expert function, you didn't look that closely. You invoke that so that it runs at runtime, you're gonna pay that price. So, and lastly, the, uh, the point about the compilers are not required to do this stuff at, uh, at compile time. So there's a quality of implementation issue. I didn't think that was going to take that long. Now we're getting to the interesting part. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Variated templates, they're there because people have been irritated for now 13 years about how you make something that looks like a variadic template. And now we've got a way to do it. And there will be new stuff coming out of here. And you know, there's a bunch of new stuff that has already popped out. And I suspect just as the, the metaprogramming stuff came out of, that, that nobody expected came out of templates, there may be yet more magic coming out of here. I don't know what it is. And you won't see any of that magic from me. Um, so there are two kinds. There are variadic class templates. There are variadic function templates. The class templates, just like you'd expect, they just have a bunch of types. The variadic function templates, well, they have types and they have parameters, just like all functions have parameters. And you've got to know the type of your parameter. So in the case of function templates, you have a pair of things. You have the, the, the list of types and you have your list of parameters. And the way you make these things is with the ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. And the dot, 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 um, in all of these instances, these are all things from the, uh, from the standard library. The dot, dot, dot in all of these instances, uh, examples, that dot, dot, dot makes something called a parameter pack. There are two kinds. Uh, Variadic class templates need a template parameter pack. And the variadic function templates need a template parameter pack for the types and a function parameter pack for the values. So you've got, in the case of a function, the, the ellipsis has to show up in two different places. For the class, it only has to show up once. I love it. 
there's this blue circle just sitting there waiting for something. So I watched uh, Alexandrescu's, actually I think I've watched maybe two of his videos where he talked about what it is. And he called it a new, a new kind because it's not a type. Mm -hmm. My inclination is that it's even less than that. It's, it's a notation that the compiler sees. And by the time the compiler is all done with it, it's turned into something else. So it's not even a kind. It's, a, it's, it's something that the compiler sees. And you, you can probably argue with me about that. All code is just something the compiler sees. I could say that. <laughs> yeah. okay. So the compiler always replaces the parameter packs with zero to n types. So, so just because you have a parameter pack in your hand doesn't mean that there's anything in it. It could be empty. And you, know, you could be looking at it and say, hey, there's this thing, and it might be empty. So you've got zero to n types, you've got zero to n arguments. In the case of function types, um, they're always, uh, they're run together. So you can't, you can't have a different number of types from parameters. They're always matched up in the case of functions. So before this stuff ever gets, well, when, when the compiler's all done with it, the parameter pack is completely filled in. The, the presence of the, the parameter pack has disappeared by the time it gets to the link group. So, so everything's been filled in. So the class template parameter packs, you can have at most one parameter pack. It comes at the end. And you can have as many types sitting in front of it as you want to. So you're, you're, the very added part has to come at the end. The function parameter paths. All right. So this was this was the slide I had the hardest time writing because it's once you play with it, it becomes intuitive. Describing it is miserable. So function parameter declaration. <laughs> containing a template parameter pack expansion. We may be better off just walking past this slide and looking at some examples and then maybe coming back if we think it's useful. But it is worth looking at the example here. So here we've got some tuples. So we're going to deal with some tuples. Each of the tuples has types, some set of types. And so here's a case where the, the, uh, the class declarations, if it's, if it's just a, a variadic class, it can't have the ellipsis in two places. It can only have it at the end. But because this is a function, here in, in the declaration of the types, we can have the dot, dot, dots show up more than once because of the association from here to here. It knows what to do. That doesn't necessarily make sense yet. Don't worry about it. It may not make sense by the time I'm done. There are a bunch of things that you have to see five times before they stick. What is that? But the, in the case of the, uh, the functions, as I said before, the packs are always in lockstep. And, and what lockstep means doesn't make sense yet either. We'll get to that. So the very simplest example, and I have to, well, anyway, the very simple example I could come up with was one where I didn't have to actually deal with the contents of the variadic. So I have a couple old style variadics, you know, which, which were not really variadic, we were thinking it was a variadic. So I've got uh, two functions that, I've got three arguments, I've got zero arguments, and I'm gonna, make a new style variadic with our ellipsis. And all it does is it takes in some set of, of arguments and then it calls one of these other guys. 
So here in our in our, uh, in our main, we're going to call a new style variadic with three arguments. And a new style variadic doesn't know and doesn't care how many arguments it gets passed. It just picks those up and forwards them to an old style variadic. And, and we're in luck. There are old style variadics that know how to deal with that many parameters. And it prints what you'd expect. So just to, to say this, almost all of the variadic template examples that I've seen, the ones where people are doing useful stuff, they tend to be with variadic functions, not so many variadic classes. So we're going to start with the variadic functions. There are places for variadic classes, and we'll get to that last. But we're going to start with the one where I suspect when you want to do variadics, this is probably the place where you want to do it, is with the functions. Mm -hmm. yes. Can you combine this with the jet file? Thank you, pardon? Uh, can, you, can you combine this with um, compilation at compile time, like you showed before? With, with uh, combining with um, the expression. Expressions uh, with const expert. Yeah. Um, sure. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't. I haven't tried it yet. I. There's very little in the standard that allows one thing to be. You know, if you're using this, you can't do this. So if you can find a way to jam them together. You can probably do it. The standard will, will, will allow you to do it. Uh, yeah, so what I will say is that the, the example with the, um, the binary literal that we, that we looked at earlier, I had expected for that code to be an example here in periodic templates. And by the time I was done, it didn't need any templates. So, yeah, you might find a place where you want to combine them, but I think the const expert stuff is so powerful that to a large extent, you may not need to do templates to get what you want. Maybe. So um, I get to thank Scott Myers for, for this particular example. Because um, I've, I've seen a couple of presentations by Alexandrescu, and, and when I walked out of this, I was like, wow, variadic templates are amazing. Now, how do I use them? <laughs> and with the, I, I got the Scott Myers slides, and um, he had what I think is, is a really, it's, it's not a useful example, but it gives you an intuition for what in the heck is going on. So we're going to walk through that. So, We're going to do uh, template recursion. Um, let me qualify that. It looks like recursion. It's not actually recursion. Because even though we're calling a template of the same name, so we're going to call, we have a template called variadic C out. We're going to call variadic C out. But each time we call variadic C out, we're going to call it with a different number of parameters. And that means that each instance of variadic C out will be unique. So it looks like recursion, but it's not. It's calling a chain of separate functions. Each one of them is, is distinct. So we've got one, one function declaration that does recursion, and then somehow or other we have to get out of the recursion. So you end up declaring these guys twice. So you have one that does your recursion and one that stops it. So I'm going to call variadic C out with a bunch of different stuff. And if we go back and look at what we had, what we're doing is yeah, okay, so let's, let's actually maybe, what am I supposed to be done? Six. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so we've got two minutes to go. <laughs> um, quick throw out all the candy. I can, yeah, so, so I am hoping that all of this candy is gone. I'm, done. I'm not, yeah, so I'm not going to stop as long as there's anyone who wants to listen. Um, but don't feel like you have to stay. So, so what we're doing, what we're learning how to do here is how to unpack, how to, we've got this parameter pack. We've got a bunch of things. We don't even know how many they are. We don't know what they are. We're figuring out how to unpack that pack, how to pull it apart. So, the way, the, a, a common and typical way to do that is to declare your variable so that it has a type sitting at the front and everything else goes into the parameter pack. So when the very first time we call variable CF, let's just say that we call it with, with, with a T, a single T. What we're going to get is one value in here and then this is going to be empty. And so we'll do the CF. I just lied, because that's not really what's going to happen. No, no, okay, I didn't lie. Okay, good, good, it's nice. So, so <laughs> the first T is going to show up here, we're going to print it, and then we're going to call variadic C out with the rest. And in this case, it's empty, okay, like we just called it with one. So if it's empty, then we can't call it with this one, because it will take a T. So we're going to call this one, and that's going to end the recursion that we didn't actually recurse through. So, and now we're going to get the, uh, the end line and the end of string. So if you got called with two, then we're going to drop that, the, the one at the beginning of the list is going to, we're going to do the CI, and we're going to call, but we still have something in our parameter pack. So we're going to call ourselves. But this time, so you're, you're getting the plan, right? Yeah. If, say every eight items you want to put in a new line to start it so it doesn't just keep going and on and on. Is there any way to test the count on what's, how many things are in the parameter? Okay. You betcha. Oh, you betcha. So, and, and you can do that by passing extra, extra values. So, Anyway, now that, you can, now that we've talked through that, this probably makes more sense. So we're going to print out each one of these things, each one at a different level of recursion. And uh, my, my apologies and, and thanks to Scott Myers. So what we're going to look at now is that recursion down through the example that we just watched. And I'm going to just kind of hit the space bar here so you can kind of get the sense that, yeah, all right, I'm going to spit out the look, then I'm going to spit out the 3.4, then I'm going to spit out the ampersand, and then I'm going to spit out 4.8. And each one of these things has some leftover stuff in that parameter pack. So the parameter pack is getting things sucked out of it as we go along. And at some point, we're going to hit the bottom. So building a parameter pack is trivial. You just put your variables in there, and the compiler knows what the types are. It knows what the, what the values are, and it's going to take care of the work for you. Um, if you already have a parameter pack, then you can tag stuff on either end, and as much stuff as you want on either end, but you can't dig into the middle of it. It's glued together. So that's for building the parameter pack, which you're going to pass. When you're pulling from the parameter pack, you can only pull from the front. You can remove as many at one time as you want, as long as there are that many in the parameter pack. This is all happening at compile time. So if you ask for something that isn't there, if you said, 
give me three and it only has two, it will stop the compilation. You'll never have to worry about running bad code. So for a more realistic example, let's look at doing a variadic min. So I'm calling this monotype min because you can only pass in one type. We're going to leverage standard min. Standard min only knows how to compare to two of the same types. So, and we'll, we'll take another run at min in a minute. But just for the simplest, this is not the simplest possible example, but this is a more realistic example. And you know, somehow I, people, people like it when it's not quite so much of a toy. So we've got monotype min. Um, we have to pass in at least one value, because if you want to take a minimum, well, it's nice to have something to compare to. Um, and then there's some number of things we're going to compare to. And really all we're going to do is we're going to suck off this guy, and then we're going to call monotype min again. And then whatever the lower down monotype min returns is what we're going to apply the standard min. So each one of these guys is going to return something. So we have to stop the recursion. So we've got the guy up here at the, at the very end of the recursion. And all he does is he returns the value that he got. He doesn't have to think very hard about it. So we're going to get all the way down to the bottom. And then as we kind of walk back up the, the stack, we're going to do min on each one of these elements. And at the end of it, the last min is what's going to win. The last min standing. The last minute. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Skittles or service? <laughs> I didn't hit anybody that time. Um, so uh, there's there's an attribute slide at the end, but I want to say I got this off the web. I did some tuning on it, but uh, there both of these min examples I pulled off the web, and it, I so. It's, it's worth acknowledging the folks that, that provided me some help. I, you know, so it's Nordlo and Andre Caron, and you can look at their site or the, the place where the discussion is taking place. And like I said, there's an attribute slide at the end. So we haven't really gained anything. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool. Let's see if we can do one better. One of the suggestions they had was, well, you know, it's kind of unusual to take the minimum of, of a single value. So maybe we ought to require that min gives us at least two values. And what happens if we give it different types? So we're going to look at that one next. Uh, the code gets a little bit bigger, and it's miserable trying to write code that fits on a PowerPoint slide. So we have to, at least the only thing I found to do is to split the code apart. So we'll look at the interesting side of it first. This is the, the recursive part. Um, the other interesting thing is that there's this uh, part of the standard called common type. It is a variadic template where you can pass in any number of different types, and it will return to you what is the thing that, that, is, that, that they would all convert to. So we're going to leverage that. We don't have to know how it works. We just have to know that it's there. We're going to leverage that. We're going to get passed in a bunch of stuff, and we're going to say, well, okay, if we get past all this stuff, what can we convert it all to? And that's what we're going to use for our min. And we're also going to require that they pass us at least two arguments. Yes? So, um, you make the return type a reference, but you accept different types as arguments. There's no way that's going to work. Because the moment you have the conversion to the common type, mm -hmm. unless it happens to be a base class of everything, it's not going to be allowed to bind. So either, so either you get a compile error saying, mm -hmm. I can't bind this temporary that an admin might return here, that the static cast would actually, the static cast would probably it's fail. Gonna do it. So yeah. basically, if you have an int and the long, and, and the common type will be long. Static cast to long reference of the int reference would just fail. Okay. So that's not going to work. Oh, well. You have to return the five values. Okay. 
it, it compiled the link and executed. Did you try testing this? I, yeah, so, and, and we'll see in a minute. So it's, it's different integer type. Well, not integer type. So it's floats, doubles, integers, charters. Um, I believe you when you say that it doesn't work because you're way better at this stuff than I am. But it did, it, it did work for me. Okay. Well, does common type mean that every type is convertible to it? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering why it's useful to pass a const reference. It, why it's useful to return a const reference anyway? Why don't we just return by value? Um, I believe that what's happening is that standard min always returns a reference. But we don't have to. Well, we don't have to use standard min. But I'm I'm not averaging standard, uh, standard min, which is which is why it's well. Different. I mean, even if it returns a reference, we can return by value what it has returned to us. Right. Right. But. Um, and, and absolutely, that could be done. That's not what I did. You know, I was doing something simpler than that. So this may not work, but it compiles and links for at least one compiler. So we're requiring two types. We're leveraging common type here. Um, we're doing the, the same old recursion we did before. And then, When we hit bottom, we're requiring two types. So this is this is how you know the requiring two types plus the, the parameter pack and requiring two types without the parameter pack. This is how we close the recursion. Interestingly, there um, the other declaration that we you know, declaration that we saw where it had two plus the parameter pack, and this one has two without the parameter pack. The compiler prefers this one because it's not very accurate. They both actually match. And so if it doesn't see this, it will try to match the other one and then it'll, you know, things will be bad. Question? Yes. Actually, don't doesn't that make the requirement that you need a, an even number of parameters? No. No, because it, 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 it doesn't pull off two at a time. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Well, I, yeah, we have to see whether. Yeah. Uh, so, just, but you, can you go back once, once line? Yeah, and 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 I, it could be that I didn't do the test right. You would have to appropriately rebuild the parameter pack for the recursion to handle an odd number, and I may have screwed that up. Yeah. So so I'll I'll grant you that that if you didn't do it right for rebuilding the parameter pack, then yeah, you could get into that. And and we'll look at my test. What we can do is we can count to see whether I actually try it with an odd number. You got lucky. So I'm, yeah, I might have or, or been unlucky because I would rather have found the bug. And look at that. There's an even number. <laughs> uh, if someone insists on taking a min of one value, just let them. Well, yeah. So yeah, this was this was a. Uh, Let's, so, let's dig a little bit further into the... Uh, I'm kind of playing with this trick because what I think it does is have lots of... I, I think it returns a bad new reference to a temporary. Oh, really? Okay. Looks like it works. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but, um, it's easy to test. I mean, just call some function that overwrites the stack right after you call common type min and see if it's still if it's still there. Yeah, yeah. So looks like it works. Maybe it doesn't. So that's that's everything I've got on variadic functions. Um, I'm gonna dig into variadic classes now. Um, and hopefully I did this one a little bit better. Let's see. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to build something that I had built as a variadic class, as, as, a, as a, an old style variadic class before. And I wanted to see what it was like with honest to God variadics. Um, so as an embedded guy on my servo loop, I want to be able to capture an error. 
I want to be able to capture it really fast. So I want to be able to take some number of values, slap them in place, and walk off. And then later on, when I'm not on my servo loop, I want to be able to suck those guys out, stream them off, and send them someplace. So that's what we're going to build. We're going to make this thing on very very out of form. And it's, for me at least, it was hard to come up with how to develop this in one shot. So I wanted to look at uh, sort of walking into it. So we're going to do a capture, which is where I've got something I'm going to pick up a bunch of thanks. You want some candy? Me? Yeah. Sure. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so thanks for listening. Thank you. So maybe you should pass this around. You guys have been for a long time. Pass that around. So we're going to come up with something that will capture a predefined, right? You know, that's, that's the template's going to define what it is we're going to capture. We're not going to know any way other than through the, the, the class template parameters. We're going to know the types, we're going to know how many. Then later on, we're going to figure out how to print something that we captured like that. And then finally, we're going to have this log thing where I can slam a bunch of values, and then at some later time, I can, I can do the actual formula of the string. Now, I'm using printf because I'm an old duffer, and I do embed it. <laughs> So I thought about, oh my god, I might have to figure out how to store each one of these values separately. But the standard library has already solved this particular problem for me with tuple. So I didn't think I wanted to figure out how tuple worked in addition to all this stuff. So let's just use this. So we're going to have a very added capture. It's got some number of types. We don't know how many types. Or we're going to make a tuple out of that. And that's our storage. Um, so we're going to have a capture function. And it doesn't, it's, it's a very added. It doesn't look like it's type city. But you'll notice that TS matches exactly the uh, sequence of types that we were handed in the class definition. So capture is going to insist that the values that are passed in here are either those types or converted to those types. And then when we do the capture, all we're going to do is we're going to call make tuple and we're going to stuff that in the storage. Yes? You said either those types are convertible to those types. Are there any way to say you want to be those types explicit? Or? Uh, I, uh, that's a C ism that I've never really conquered because I've uh, too many situations where you know it would take take some candy on the way out. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of situations where you just can't prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I So just for grins, we're going to say, all right, how many, how many items are we going to capture? And it's always, ah, OK. And so here's something new. You can ask a parameter pack how big it is. And it's just called size of. But you have to include the ellipsis, which you know, I was trying to figure out, well, how does this work? OK, so if you say size of ellipsis and then the parameter pack, you can find out how many thingies are in there. Um, and then an interface where we can get an entry. Now, because we're using uh, tuple <coughs> to know which entry we're going to compile time, it doesn't have a runtime way of indexing into its, its elements. So this is kind of a bizarre interface. So let's use it. We're going to create one of these guys. Uh, we're going to say, we know how many entries are in there. We know that at compile time. We're going to uh, toss some values in there. If we toss in, uh, because we declared that as an int, if I try to toss a double in there, it won't stick. The compiler will say, hey, that's not the right time. On the other hand, if I toss an integer in here, and because we declared this as a double, it's going to convert that to a double. 
and then we can get the contents out. But we, can, we have to do the indexing at compile time. So it ends up being just a wrapper around tuple. Um, it's not particularly easy to use because of the, the constraint on the indexing. But, you know, we're just learning. Maybe this is going to get better. So how do we print now that we have this tuple? How do we take those contents, suck it out of the tuple in the right order, and turn it into something that printf, an ancient C function, can deal with? So we have to come up with something that unrolls a tuple. See if I can get through this right. So this is our recursion. Um, we've got a class. So this is a template class that we're calling tuple and Raymer. It takes one parameter, which is an integer. I stole this from somebody on the web. I don't think I could have figured this out on my own. Uh, so the integer on the template allows us to do a specialization for zero. So that we've got a way to terminate. This is, it's that integer on the class that's going to allow us to walk through the entries in the tuple. You can't do it with a function, I don't believe. I tried three different ways. This one works. All right, so we're going to get past a format string, we're going to get past a tuple. Uh, this tuple is not going to change. And we're going to get past args. The very first time we get called, args is going to be empty. And what we're going to do as we walk through and unroll is we're going to build up args. We're going to be dropping in these parameters one at a time. So when we get called, <clears throat> we're going to make sure that so the static assert is to make sure that we stay inside of the, uh, of the tuple. Here what we're going to do is we're going to get, uh, get the value out. By using n minus 1, this allows us to be called the very first time with the size of the tuple, rather than having to call with size of tuple minus 1. And then <clears throat> once we've uh, gotten that particular argument out, we're going to repass the format string, we're going to repass that tuple without changing it, we're going to drop in the arg that we just pulled out, and then we're going to pass the arg we passed. And so what we're going to do is we're going to slowly build the parameter. I see a bunch of people nodding, so this must not be too bad. Yes? Just and the equal to, not less than or equal to the size of tuple, or am I missing something? Um, so, on the static assert? Yeah. Um, no, because n is going to be walking down. So, oh, n is walking. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so if you if you see which class oh, we're in, so I we're invoking a class. We're going to be walk. We're, we're going to walk n down. N is is almost our index into the tuple. So we want to start at the size of the tuple minus one. We want to walk down to zero. And we're just about to get to the class that terminates, or the, the specialization that terminates the uh, the recursion. Yes. For what it's worth, there's a um, boost fusion invoke that must work similarly to this, except it's not very adequate. Okay. Well, and it is it is very attic in the old sense. It was it was how they would have to fake that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the specialization that finally gets to do the print. So all of that recursion leading up to here was simply to build the the, the parameters that were being passed to print. And once we've sucked all those arguments out, they work perfectly with printf. All of the types are preserved. Printf works just as it always has. This one's cool. So the, um, the last thing to toss in is that I didn't want to expose a bunch of that machinery 
to users of this thing. So you make a, a, a function, printf tuple, and all it does is it uses the tuple and loader. So it hides all that machinery. Could you look back up on you the gotcha. two? So that, that n minus 1, that's where the recursion happens. Um, well, why are you, um, what do you call it? Do you, you originally call it with your full set? Yes. Oh, I know. I see. I see. No, he calls it with a tuple and an empty hand. Yeah, yeah. The first, the first set of things is empty. Empty, right? Yeah, we have no parameters in it. Right, because you have to get them out of that. Yeah. 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 So that initial invocation, yeah. we don't even have anything sitting there. We don't, we don't pay attention to the fact that it's very out of hand. Extra stuff. Okay. So this is this is the guy that that makes it easy, relatively easy to use. So we're going to make a tuple, and then we're going to print it. And it works. So that's not too bad. It was that by the time we were done, it was pretty easy to use. There weren't any, at least the cases that I tried, and I'm not a QA guy, but the cases that I tried were not surprising. So it did what you wanted. So now that we've done that work, let's walk through the, the final guy. So, so we're actually getting close to dinner now. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you guys so long. So we've got three slides. So for me, I'm using this for error messages. I want to know whether it's fired or not. I'm going to create this thing, and it's going to sit there. And it's going to wait for somebody to have an error. If it has an error, we're going to fire it. But if it doesn't have an error, then I don't want it to say anything. So we want to know whether it's fired. We want to know what the format string is. And we need the storage for the values. So we're going to construct it with a format string. We're going to say it's not fired when it's constructed. And we're going to hold on to the format string for later on. Yes. Um, yeah, okay, so and if Tony were here, he'd crucify me for using volatile. So the, the way, uh, this, is, this is a rough approximation of what I do in an embedded system, where I've got a, uh, an interrupt, where I'm trying to capture stuff, and then I've got another thread, if you will, that's, that is not time critical. Mm -hmm. And so this is volatile because it's being used across two threads. Well, if it's an interrupt, that's okay, actually. The way I see it. Oh, okay. My, I mean, it depends on how the compiler map, maps interrupt. If it kind of looks like public signal, then it should probably be a SIG atomic. Yeah, so I have an ancient compiler, um, and, and volatile is the best I can do. It, and I, I care about managing the order in which, so, so, Volatile for my compiler, I'm, and I'm pretending that my compiler is C++ 11, which it clearly isn't. But going through that that pretend stuff, for me, volatile presents a fence to the compiler. So I care whether I fill in the values in the very end, in, in the tuple before I say that it's fired. So so that's something that's important on the servo interrupt that I have to get those values in place. And then once the values are in place, I want it to say fired. And if I don't declare the fired as a volatile, <coughs> then the compiler may reorder that. So when we fire, like I said, we want to fill in the storage first. We want to get those values. And then we want to say, yeah, we fired. And if we fired before, we care about the first error more than the second one. So if if someone calls us again and we've already fired, we don't want to pick up new values. That's the reason for the if. 
and so you've got this other function that we want to call on a different thread. This is, hey, dude, have you fired? If you did, tell me what happened. So if fired, then we're going to call printf tuple, which we already built. And then once we're done with that, we're going to say fired is false because he's already done his job of reporting the error. And so we can fire again. This is very close to some code. That, the reason this was, was interesting to me was when I wrote the code, uh, for this thing, um, I had to write it seven times because I, I allowed up to six parameters to be used in the type. And so I had to rewrite it, uh, supporting six parameters, five parameters, four parameters, all the way down to zero parameters. And with this, if I were able to do this with my compiler, I would only have to write it once. So, here we are in the Star Trek Enterprise, and uh, <clears throat> we've noticed that the cabin temperature has gotten up to 180 degrees. I don't know whether that's Fahrenheit, Celsius, or uh, Kelvin. So uh, we're going to create the log. We're going to pretend to run another thread. We're going to fire it, and we're going to print it. Learn to love recursion. Even if it's not really recursion, it feels like it. And yeah, uh, other than the dangling references that I left behind in my, uh, my advanced min, um, they're not too bad. We were talking about how this is not real recursion. So keep an eye on code blood. You know, this is not, this is, this is a, at some level, it's a big gun. Um, if you don't care about code blood, then don't worry about it. I worry about it. I've only got three megabytes uh, for everything. So I can't, uh, I can't just let this stuff go. Um, yeah, and I want this. Can you mention that to the bees? We're done. Fragment static assert, explicit conversion operators, double type, constructs for invariant templates. And the sources are in the slides. The slides will be on the website. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the help. Uh, and thank you for me going 30 minutes over time. <laughs> <laughs>